Welcome to episode nine of Shane Talks 99. Uh, our ninth episode, my favorite number. All right. It is March 12th, 1999. And once again, we have a trifecta of diverse genres to discuss this week. Teen angst, corrupt cops, and a sci-fi video game, all of which were released on March 12th, 1999. All right, let's start off with our teen angst film uh, in the form of the first of eight remakes, sequels, or franchise films that it came out in 1999. That's it, eight. In 1999, only eight films on the entire release schedule were remakes, sequels, or part of a franchise. That's a that's a topic that I'm, I'm going to do an episode on at some point, uh, comparing those three categories and all eight films with 20 years later in 2019, when uh, I want to say it's in the forties, 45 movies were released that fall into those categories. Uh, But yeah, so this one is the first one out of eight in 1999. It is the rage carry two. It's available to watch for free with some commercials on the Tubi app, which is where I watched it this week because I could not track down a DVD to watch. Um, So the rage carry Two, which started off with a couple of different other titles and then it was the rage. And then apparently they just decided to add carry Two on uh, later when they decided uh, this plot is a lot like uh, the original carry film. And it didn't start out that way. Long, long ago in 1993, there was a big sex scandal, a high school sex scandal with a bunch of guys in California that um, made like a point based system for sexual things that they could get girls to do with them. Um, It ended up becoming a huge deal. It involved a lot of like date rape. Um, It involved uh, videotaping girls without knowing that they were being videotaped, all kinds of stuff like that. I remember it pretty well because I was a freshman the year after this story like became huge and broke. So it was always one of those things that was talked about in high school. Like, can you believe, you know, that people did this type thing? So the writer took that and and kind of created the story and the revenge plot, um, you know, based on that. And then somebody in the studio was like, wow, this ends up being very similar to the movie Carrie. So let's just rewrite some stuff, make her Carrie's half-sister, and uh, we'll turn it into a Carrie sequel. So that's why we get The Rage, Carrie 2. Now, speaking of movies with similar plot points, that is going to be the uh, episode 64 of Shane Talks next week when Jason and I talk about identical plot twins. Uh, We've got a lot of uh, good movies that are very similar plots that were suggested by the Facebook community. So that's what we're going to be talking about on next week. Uh, Shane Talks, episode 64. Anyway, back to 1999, back to our teenage angst sex movie that we've got. Um, the lead character in this is a woman named Rachel Lang. Uh, she is played by Emily Burgle. Uh, this was her first film role she ever had, and sadly, it pretty much became the only uh, studio release that's on her resume. Uh, she did go on to do a lot of TV work. She was on Gilmore Girls and Desperate Housewives, and then she was also on the Mindhunter show for Netflix. So not, not a huge film career for her, but definitely found, found a lot of work on television. Her best friend is played by Mina Suvari, who we talk about a lot in 1999. Not going to talk about her very much right here because her character doesn't last very long in the movie before she commits suicide. Spoiler alert, the movie is over 20 years old. Sorry. Uh, her character commits suicide. Um but she is also in American Pie in August, and she will be talked about in American Beauty in October. So Mina Suvari got a lot, a lot going on in 1999. Her American Pie co-star um, is uh, Eddie K. Fin- or Eddie K. Thomas, who plays Finch in American Pie. He plays one of Rachel's only other like friends in this movie. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see him kind of play a kind of dorky, nerdy role. I mean, I guess Finch is kind of a dork nerd, but. Very similar yet very polar opposites in in their characters. Um, in the in the group of douche bros in this movie, there's really only two names that stand out: uh, Jason London, who I consider to be the lesser London when you compare him to his brother Jeremy London from Mallrats, um, uh, and then Zachary Ty Bryan from Home Improvement was also one of the douche bros in this movie. There's like a group of six of them. 
Um, one of them looks familiar, the kind of Latino guy, but I don't know his name and I don't know anything else that I've seen him in. Um, this film continues our late 90s sex driven teenage films. It really doesn't hold back. There's a lot of sexual content in this. Like I said, rape is discussed, um, videotaping of, of uh, Mina Suvari's character and of um, the main character in this is, is part of the plot. So it's, a, it's an okay movie. Like, it's fine. Um, parts of it parts of it don't make a lot of sense to me and it gets really annoying because there's like random shots in this movie that go black and white for no reason. And it really happens a lot at the beginning and then a couple of times later on in the movie. But like, it just gives you this weird vibe that just doesn't make sense. Like things go black and white for no reason. Like sometimes a flashback will be in black and white, but then later in the movie, there will be another flashback, but that flashback's in color. So it's not like they were using the black and white to signify flashbacks. Cause there's also a scene where she's sitting in like the guidance counselor's office and it, she looks at a, a mug and the mug is black and white when she looks at it. But when it cuts back to her, it's, it's back in color. Why is the mug in black and white for one shot? Like, it's just things like that that don't make sense. Um, they tie this back into the original Carrie film by having the guidance counselor be the same actress. I'm drawing a blank on her name, um, but she was from the original uh, Carrie in 1978, I think it was, um, maybe 76, somewhere around there. Uh, anyway, they, they tie the movies together by having her play that character and and talk to this main character uh, played by Emily Burgle and discuss the fact that she knew her her stepsister or half sister. They share the same father uh, through the plot of this bizarre movie, despite the fact that there's like a 20 year difference between them or whatever. Um, but anyway, so th th there's some things that just don't make sense storytelling wise to me like i said that black and white stuff doesn't make sense but i did read uh when i was reading up on the movie this week that the director that originally was hired to do it didn't last very long he apparently had a lot of creative differences with the studio i assume maybe that's some of it possibly um after he walked off a woman named cat shay ended up taking over the movie she wouldn't direct another studio film for another 20 years. And, and like, I mean, theatrically released studio film. In those 20 years between 1999 and 2019, she actually only directed two other made-for-TV movies during that time. But the one thing I will say about Kat Shea, despite the fact that I don't really know her or very much of her work, is she obviously knew the teenage sex storyline tell or storytelling from the 90s because she was also the director on a movie called Poison Ivy, um, which growing up in the 90s, if you're, if you're a male kid of the 90s, you know Poison Ivy and you know, you know why we watched it back when we did. So anyway, I really enjoyed Emily Burgle's character in this movie. I thought she was a really great casting choice. I thought she did a really good job with the character. And she like... She's not like emo and she's also not goth, but she just kind of crosses both of them enough to make her not be a cliche and to seem like real and relatable. So like I re she has moments where she smiles and, and could potentially be a happy person, but you can also get the vibes of like her, her messed up childhood and stuff like that that have led her to where she is. So I just thought she was the real solid part uh, in this kind of just okay teen horror movie. Next up, we're going to talk about Marky Mark and Chow Yun Fat in The Corrupter. Uh, I was able to get my hands on the DVD of this one, so that made me happy. Uh, Marky Mark and Chow Yun Fat star in this movie that was directed by James Foley. James Foley kind of seems to be the guy, you get him to direct uh, like novels or stage productions because his resume has him he directed the uh david mamet's glenn gary glenn ross which i think is a phenomenal movie it like influenced wall street and stuff like that but just the dialogue mamet's dialogue is always phenomenal uh and it's really good with an amazing cast in glenn gary glenn ross he directed the adaptation of john grisham's the chamber which isn't the best john grisham adaptation but it's also not bad um more recently, he directed the second and third movies in the Fifty Shades franchise, Fifty Shades Free and Fifty Shades Again, or whatever the hell it's called. Uh, so he did both of those. 
1996, he did direct a movie called Fear, which also starred Marky Mark. So that's probably how one or the other got the job in this movie. Most likely he was hired as the director and said, I just worked with Marky Mark. I want Marky Mark in this movie. And they were like, cool. Because Mark Wahlberg was also really high off of Boogie Nights. Uh, I'd seen him in the big hit. Um, and then later this year in 99, he is also going to be with George Clooney in the movie Three Kings, which is going to be a blast to talk about because it is just such a good movie. Uh, so anyway, right around this time uh, in my life, uh, 98, 99-ish, I had seen the movie The Replacement Killers. Loved it. Thought it was really awesome. Because I liked it so much and looked into Chow Yun Fat, I found out about Hard Boiled, watched Hard Boiled. It was phenomenal also. So I was really high on this movie. Like, I was like, oh, you know, Chow Yun Fat, like, he's, he's doing another American movie. And it, it's just not good. And it's not Chow Yun Fat's fault. It's really just this character in the movie. Not done very well. The whole plot is very paint by numbers and doesn't really have a whole lot of exciting or interesting stuff that goes on in it um other cast members that kind of are known well one other cast member that's kind of known is a guy named byron mann um he's one of the antagonists in this movie his other big major film credit uh was as ryu in the 1994 film street fighter the jean-claude van damme raul julia street fighter and then sadly he was also in the 2003 uh bomb Catwoman. so that's kind of sad for him but the only other real big name that's in this movie that has a very small part is Brian Cox. And Brian Cox was on fire in the 90s, uh, specifically the late 90s, because he did movies uh, in the second half of the 90s. He was in Chain Reaction, The Glimmer Man, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Kiss the Girls, Desperate Measures. And then, like, he's just a couple of years away from being uh, William Stryker in X2. Um, so, yeah, he's he's he has a great run of movies uh, right around this time. So the last movie we're going to talk about here, we're going to talk about, we're going to wrap this whole thing up by talking about a movie that is critically panned. And majority of my friends hate this movie. And it's the video game adaptation of Wing Commander. Sci-fi film based on a really popular video game franchise. Uh, it currently has a 10% score on Rotten Tomatoes. But the audience score is 25%, so at least people kind of like it more than the critics do. Uh, this is one that I did have to pay $4 to rent it from Apple. Um, I was not able to track down a DVD uh, recently or even a VHS tape. Well, not that I could really watch a VHS tape, but um, tried to find it, couldn't. So tonight I had to pay the $4 to watch it so that it was fresh in my head. And I'm not, like, that's $4 I'm not upset about, like, I enjoyed watching the movie. It is a very 90s sci-fi piece of work. Um, is it good? No. Is it is it fun? Kind of. And it's fun. I'll, I'll throw this out there, and you're going to understand exactly why I think this movie is so fun. Because of the cast that we have in this movie. Matthew Lillard and Freddie Prince Jr. And here's, here's the other thing I want to say about it. Earlier... I was talking about how Jason and I are going to do an episode called Identical Plot Twins. And one of the movies that started that whole thing is uh, Top Gun and Days of Thunder. Uh, somebody said to Jason that those are the exact same movie. They have the exact same plot. I'm going to say Wing Commander is Top Gun in space. And now hear me out. You've got, you've got the hotshot pilot. Who, who comes in and he butts heads with the other hotshot pilot that's already there. Uh, he flirts with a female who is his superior. And he has a sidekick who's a wide, wisecracking, goofball, you know, kind of ridiculous person. So I'm, I'm calling this movie Top Gun in Space. Um, Again, it probably would have worked better as like an hour-long sci-fi TV pilot or episode of a of a 90s science fiction television show. Eh, who knows? Probably one of the biggest problems with this is the fact that the studio ended up giving uh, the story duties and the directing duties to Chris Roberts, who was the guy who created the video game. Now, like, why... 
why you would give so much power to the guy just because he created the video game to to helm this big budget science fiction, very bad CGI movie. I, I don't completely understand. But the one thing I do have to say good about Chris Roberts is uh, he never directed another movie. Uh, he did not become a director. He did, however, become a producer. And he produced a handful of things that I actually really enjoy. Um, the Thomas Jane version of The Punisher he produced. Uh, and then, like, right around the same time, he also produced the Adrian Brody Kira Knightley film called The Jacket, which is basically a time travel psychological thriller movie. Um, and I really enjoy it also. So Chris Roberts, not the best director, but turned out to produce some some stuff that I really like. Um, the one last thing that I will say when I'm comparing it to Top Gun, I forgot to mention a second ago, is there are a lot of references to being inverted in Wing Commander. Um, so I feel like whoever wrote Wing Commander was a huge Top Gun fan. He had to. Why else would you reference being inverted multiple times uh, in the movie? So anyway, Top Gun in space. All right. Uh, I've already mentioned Freddie Prince Jr. and Matthew Lillard. So those are the two names that you obviously know I am madly in love with. Both of those dudes love them, love their bodies of work. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Let's move on to the rest of the cast that are, you know, kind of a big deal. Uh, Saffron Burroughs uh, plays the actual wing commander of this ship. Uh, she is the superior to Freddie Prince Jr.'s main character. They end up having a romance. Um, in 1999, we are blessed to see her again later this uh, year. I think it's August-ish, maybe October. Somewhere in there, she is in the film Deep Blue Sea, which is ridiculously fun in a bad way uh so it's gonna be fun to talk about her again uh really enjoyed her in this movie i feel like she's one of the actual good parts of the film uh, we then have turkish actor chieke kiario who i loved in the film la femme nikita then he was also in goldeneye and he was awesome as the villain in uh bad boys amazing actor terrible for this film role like and it's really just the character that's bad he was he was fine in a very poorly used character. Next up, we've got the German, Jürgen Proschnow. Uh, he has an awesome film career. Uh, he was Baron von Wolfgang von Wolfhausen from the movie Beer Fest. Um, more importantly, probably, he was Duke Leto uh, Atreides in David Lynch's version of Dune, uh, essentially the Oscar Isaac character um, in the new Dune. He was also the woodsman in Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. Obviously has a good relationship with David Lynch there. Um, amazing actor. Finally, rounding out the, the cast of, of kind of older characters in this is David Warner. The David Warner. Uh, Tron. He was the MPC himself in Tron. He was in Time Bandits. He had roles in both Star Trek Five and Six. I'm pretty sure he was on The Next Generation at some point also. He was the uh, the doctor in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. And my personal favorite David Warner role, he was Sidney Prescott's director of the play she was in at Windsor College in Scream 2. So those are our three films this week. Wing Commander is not a bad movie. Go check it out again if you haven't seen it in a long time. It is a sci-fi lower masterpiece. Not really at all. It's 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 pretty cheesy, but it is a it is a perfect '90s bad CGI uh, science fiction film that is that is not bad if you just go along for the fun ride, um, or if you think about it as Top Gun in space. So next week we have another trifecta of movies. We have the rom-com uh, Forces of Nature, which stars my boy Ben Affleck. It's also one of the movies that really kind of made me fall in love with Sandra Bullock just because, like, her character in this movie is so free-spirited and fun-loving that, like, very, very huge crush I, I had on her character in this movie. Um, the Clint Eastwood film True Crime is uh, is going to be up there, and that's one that I'm having trouble remembering. I know Clint Eastwood did a couple of movies around this time that I liked. I need to look up which one this one is. And then finally, ugh, this one is going to be tough to go back and rewatch because I remember hating it. But from Scream, we have David Arquette. From L.A. Confidential, we have um, oh, Edmund Exley is his character's name in L.A. Confidential. It is Guy Pierce. 
Uh, they were in the movie Ravenous together. And Ravenous was one where I remember watching the preview and being like, oh, this could be kind of interesting. And it wasn't. It was really kind of bad and was about people eating other people. And yeah, so cannibalism. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. It's going to be a fun time travel back to the 90s next week. Uh, I look forward to talking to you guys then. Thanks for listening.